I will call our work session to order of September 27, 2021. We have three items to discuss, electric vehicle charging standards, bicycle parking standards, and firearm sales regulation. And I will pass it directly to Assistant Community Development Director, Melissa Paleman. Thank you, Mayor, uh, members of the Planning Commission. Right, so we have three topics tonight. Um, I hope it's okay that when I speak, I took off my mask. That's been our practice. Okay. Um, the first two topics that we're going to cover tonight are related to our sustainability and resiliency goals in the comprehensive plan. This is going to be the first introduction that you all have to these items and our thoughts on these items. Um, it's really going to be a, this is where we're at, this is where we're thinking of going. Let's get some preliminary feedback and um, make sure that uh, in general we're on board with moving these items forward. And then um, we have some of that feedback so that we know how to start crafting uh, these changes if that's what you decide. The third item is a follow-up on a previous work session from July, uh, the firearms related issues. That one should be fairly quick. We just want to affirm what we heard previously. Um, call out some items that might still be um, something you want to consider uh, before we draft an ordinance and bring it to the Planning Commission, which will hopefully be uh, yet later this year. We're gonna keep these topics to 15 minutes since we have three items. So um, I'll be keeping time if I cut you off. <laughs> Please feel free to contact us afterward with any follow-up comments. Um, and then if we have extra time at the end, we'll come back to those. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to um, Assistant Planner Nellie Jerome for our first two items. Good evening. Um, so the first uh, item that we'll, we'll be talking about is the electric vehicle charging stations. Um, so, change that. so just some background on electric vehicles. Um, the uh, transportation industry is uh, almost 30% of greenhouse gas emissions in, I think, just the U.S., um, which is the largest share. Um, there are only 500 electric vehicle chargers in the Twin Cities area right now. Um, but we need to get to 16,000, um, 9,000 to 16,000 if we're going to um, make it to 10% of market share for electric vehicles of all cars. Um, the 9,000 to 16,000 is kind of a, a rough estimate based on um, charging availabil availability at people's homes. So if people um, live in older apartment buildings and then they don't have access to chargers necessarily, then we'd want more charging infrastructure, so we'd go closer to the 16,000 in the region. Um, electric vehicle sales are also increasing globally. Um, so they, uh, let's see, in 2025, they're projected to increase to 8.5 million. Um, and then because battery prices are decreasing and more models are available, they're just becoming more accessible. It is the future. Um, so some more background, there are three types of electric vehicle charger. Level one, which is your very basic, like you could have it in your garage. It's your uh, traditional 120 volt, just like an outlet. Um, and that charges really slowly, so it's best if you're commuting um, less than 40 miles per day. It, I think it takes maybe um, 16 hours to charge, 10 to 16 hours. Uh, so that's, that's very accessible for like a lot of single family homes. You just charge it in your garage. Level two, um, those are maybe more um, geared towards workplaces or commercial areas or uh, like multifamily developments. Um, level two uh, is a, tw a 240 volt, so you'd need like special equipment in order to, to set up a charging station. And then the DC chargers, which are the fastest chargers, um, I think a lot of the Tesla chargers are DC and they go super, super fast. Um, so that would be more of a, like a gas station type of use or um, like a big um, destination to get vehicles to charge really fast. Um, and those are very expensive. So the, the level ones can be $400 for just a little installation. Level two, um, 2000 to 10000 we had a developer say that they um, installed one for about 8000 I think, out in Seattle. Um, and then the DC uh, up to 100,000, so pretty fancy. Uh, just in Minnesota, oh, turn the page here. Um, so in 
2018, they made up only 1.9% of new car sales. Um, but uh, MnDOT, the Pollution Control Agency, and then uh, the Great Plains Institute had a published vision of 20% electric vehicle sales by 2030. Um, and then also in 2018, there was a program called Cities Charging Ahead, and I believe the city of Richfield was involved in that. Uh, and then they, it was kind of a year-long study, and a lot of cities pledged to put in electric vehicle um, uh, infrastructure or buy fleets of electric vehicles. Um, and we do have a, a charging station here at City Hall. But I don't know if, what level it is, so I was going to go out there and check, and I didn't. <laughs> um, so uh, um, our neighboring communities, um, only a few of them have put it into their planning, uh, their zoning codes. So Minneapolis is the most intense zoning code. They have. Um, a really detailed list of all the requirements for all the different uses. Um, but in summary, anything under three residential units does not require charging stations, um, but they do require a minimum of um, one level two space um, to be electric vehicle like ready. So it would be the conduit, so you don't need the actual charging station. Um, so EV ready is just conduit, not actual requirement. Um, and then if there are uh, more than 10 units in Minneapolis, they require 10% um, of the parking spaces at a level two actual installation charging, and then another 20% of just conduit. Um, and then for non-residential uses, it's 5% level two, and then 5% level two um, EV ready conduit. Um, in St. Louis Park, um, the uh, multifamily developments require 5% um, and then 10% uh, at level one. Um, oh, that's for multi. Oh, new expanded structures that are 1549 spaces, so smaller, requires 5% uh, at level one and then bigger. Um, developments require 10% at level one, and then one for level two. Um, and they didn't have anything about like EV ready or conduit installations, but they did include ADA requirements in their code, which was nice to see. Um, and what else? Yeah, so non-residential uh, wasn't called out. It was just, or it was 1%. Sorry, I'm mixing up my notes here. Um, Non-residential also required ADA spaces. Uh, oh, and St. Louis Park also had gas stations included in their code. So they, they said any new gas station that's built needs to have electric vehicle charging stations as well. Um, Bloomington uh, had a really, um, they didn't have a heavy number of requirements for new developments, but they did say that there's one level two charging station required per 50 units, which comes out to about 2% of the unit count has to have uh, access to a level two. Um, they also included a lot of spacing and design rules in their code, um, more than any other uh, city, but they didn't have the like in-depth of the requirements for chargers or conduit. Um, so uh, those are our neighboring cities. And then the um, local uh, best practices from the Minnesota B3 building guidelines um, are to uh, aim for 3% of parking capacity for electric vehicle charging stations. And then Great Plains Institute uh, has a um, zoning code best, best practices for electric vehicles. Um, and the highlights, I think, are number one, two, and four. So permitting electric vehicle chargers as a, um, as a permitted land use in all zoning. Um, and then making sure that you have conduit installation, so EV ready, um, because they are expensive now, but they could go down in price later. Um, and then number four was uh, electric vehicle parking space design and location. So maybe that's um, ADA, and um, you have locations for residents versus locations for visitors. So those are the, um, the highlights of the best practices. And then uh, we just had some sort of a summary of 
the zoning changes that are recommended. Uh, so charges as a permitted use in all districts, um, assign required percentages based on lot size and use and or like the amount of parking that's currently required. Uh, and then make sure there's a mix of conduit, so EV ready requirements and fully installed station requirements. And then um, include some design setback, ADA. Um, and most requirements should be a level two. Level one isn't, isn't super great for you know, bigger multifamily or commercial. Um, and then DC is also just very expensive, but is still useful. Uh, so we had some questions to consider. Uh, so what electric vehicle requirements might be of interest to the city of Ridgefield? At what level? Um, do we have different development requirements uh, for multifamily or commercial or for like major renovations? You know, if there's a, um, an existing development but they're doing a big project, we want to bring, make them bring it up to um, like a new code or a new level of electric vehicle charging requirements. Um, did we want to include ADA um, requirements for gas stations, new or existing? Um, just kind of those questions to think about. Um, and that's the end of electric vehicles. Yep, so now we're just, we've got about five minutes here um, for a little bit of discussion, and then we'll move on to the next item. If there are other things, we'll try to come back to EV at the end. But your general thoughts. Questions from folks? Councilmember Supple. Um, when you mentioned like the major renovations, so existing buildings these would not apply to. It'd be either a major renovation or a new construction. Are there any programs to help buildings retrofit and add it? Uh, Councilmember Supple, we don't have any programs that I know of to retrofit at this time. But yeah, if there was a a major renovation to an existing building. I can't remember the code off the top of my head. It's a, I think it's like a percentage of the site if, if like 50% of the site is renovated um, or 60 or something like that, then we do require them to um, bring the site into conformance with the rest of the zoning code. So we might ask them to install electric vehicles at that time if that's something that we would want them to do. Long, long term, I think it would be good if we could figure out a way to help facilitate the existing housing that we have, because we've just put a whole lot of housing into, um, it's just been built, and I don't know whether they have electric vehicle charging or not. And I do like the requirements for like the gas stations and ADA and that kind of stuff. I'll just quickly follow up on that, Council Member Seppel. We have, um, we, we don't have any regulations in place right now, but we have typically recommended, and most developers have installed the conduit. We've said this is coming. Most developers know it's coming. If they haven't installed the chargers themselves, they have installed the conduit. So that's there. Um, I think retrofitting some of these much older properties um, will be more of a challenge, but uh, places like Hennepin County and MnDOT are looking, Hennepin County is looking at a program that will help people to install the chargers. MnDOT is looking um, as part of the 494 corridor project. Um, they've committed to installing several charges, uh, chargers along the corridor, um, and we're exploring locations now. So I do think that our um, transportation partners will be helping to fund these things as well. Other comments or questions? Council Member Whalen. Um, I'll just add that I, I think any and all of this is uh, great. I'm very glad that we're having this conversation. I will trust staff to give us the best recommendation on whether a 2% or 3% or what the specific number should be. Um, but yes, I think um, there, there's been nothing suggested that I think is a bad idea or like too much. And I think absolutely it's... Uh, this is the direction we're going, and it's just a matter of um, how how quickly we want to require it. And then certainly, I think, I mean, with this just being one example of there's going to be a lot of things in terms of sustainability and addressing climate change that are going to be costly to retrofit. And so would share share that concern. I don't. Uh, I know we don't have like pockets of money lying around to create our own program, but as much as we can. Um, continue to be cognizant of and advocate for at 
the county and the state and federal level um, that there be money put into making these changes um, would also support that. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Council Member Hayford O'Leary. Uh, yeah, I also agree. I think you're on the right track um, in terms of percentages. I, I mostly defer to you, but I would say 3% seems surprisingly low if we take the 20% by 2030 market share goal seriously. So I would like to see higher. My, my only hesitation is just multifamily is already very expensive to build. Housing is already not very affordable, and this is kind of an unfunded mandate. So I would like potentially to see us, as long as we continue to have parking minimums for our apartment buildings that we potentially have a benefit for doing this, like each EV spot counts as two parking spaces or something like that, to offer an option to reduce the cost without us having to actually fork over money for these stations. But I generally like to see something with 10 to 20% range with that possible incentive. Other comments or questions? Councilmember Keneally. Commissioner. I too would like to see more aggressive numbers. Um, I'm, I'm kind of puzzled by the, the gas station site. I don't see people staying at a gas station for 45 minutes or an hour. So I'd, I'd like to see a focus on obviously workplaces, commercial retail, and restaurants. I'll just add that was going to be my comments as well. I didn't understand the mm -hmm. gas station. Um, so in terms of priority setting, you know, where are there going to be cars for extended periods of time? Um, uh, and then I'm trying to think of if there's anything else. I liked all the recommended um, items that we have up there. I'm in agreement with those, and I'd be open to hire, as others have said. Um, yeah. Council Member Whelan. Um, if I could just offer a contrasting opinion, I actually think gas stations is pretty important, um, and I think it's the like the times that we're looking at are for an entire charge. Um, that having places people can stop, and I mean, gas stations are all often located near restaurants and things. Um, even if they just plug it in for ten minutes, if I guess I recognizing they're fairly cost prohibitive um, if the DC option were possible. Again, maybe it's uh, negotiating on other requirements if they're willing to spend some money on that. But I actually think, for me personally, that's one of the biggest reasons I would consider not getting an electric vehicle. Um, because I don't know when I travel like where I can stop and charge to be able to go longer distances. Um, and I think the, the future is important to give this as not just an option for like your local commute, but to completely replace gas powered vehicles. All right, any other questions before we go to the next item? Okay. We're gonna go into bikes. Um, and these are some of the sources. So these are also available um, in the packet, and it'll be online as well. Um, so bike parking requirements, it's a little less detailed. There are no chargers required, no levels. Um, so the current Richfield policies are we require 5% of the parking spaces um, to be bike parkings. So um, what's 5% of 20? I don't know. <laughs> um, so any, anything with 20 spaces or more requires 5% to be bike, par bike parking. 5% additional spaces, not of the car spaces. Um, and that can be reduced by the director. So if somebody says, you know, nobody bikes here, we don't need this, this is not a destination, we would consider that. Um, so some of our neighbors, uh, Edina has the same policy that we do, uh, 20 or more spaces, Bike parking at 5%. St. Louis Park, um, for multifamily, it's one space per unit, um, and then 10% of spaces for commercial, um, but at least four spaces. And then um, uh, one bicycle parking space per 10 students for schools. Not every city had a school requirement, um, but it was usually like one space per student or one space per classroom or per 10 students and one space per classroom. Um, Eden Prairie was one space for every two units 
Um, and then non-residential has to have at least 10 um, and one space per you know, X number of square feet. Um, so for commercial, it was uh, 3,500 square feet. Um, and then uh, industrial is 10,000 square feet. Um, in Roseville, uh, it's at least four and then 10% of, of auto spaces. Minneapolis also had a very detailed zoning code for bike, bike parking. Uh, because they don't require parking, they had all of their uh, number of required bike parking spaces based on a square footage, so it was hard to relate that to Richfield. Um, but it's uh, for multifamily, it was one per unit. And then um, long term, they differentiated between just a regular bike parking space and long term bike parking spaces. So they're 90% uh, of their multifamily bike parking has to be in a long term space, so like a like a bike room or an enclosed um, or fenced-in area with, that's covered. Um, they also required that uh, commercial spaces have at least three um, bike parking spaces, um, or it's per square square foot. And then for really big developments over 200,000 square feet, they also required um, like showers and lockers and storage areas and um, a lot of bike infrastructure. Um, in St. Paul, it was one space per 14 unit, units, which is the lowest that I saw. And then uh, commercial and, and other uses required one space per 20 car spaces, which is about 5%. So that's about what we require. Um, and then this is just for context. These are our bike trails. I thought it would be good to know uh, sort of where tra tra trails cross and what places are accessible by bike. Um, and I. Just a note, I did bike over to the co-op for dinner tonight, and it was really hard to get up to the co-op on Lindale um, from 66, so. Um, so our best practices and recommendations, um, we would want to consider short-term versus long-term if, if that's something that we want to look at requiring. Um, we want to know if, if we should maybe increase the requirement of bike spaces for new developments, or if maybe 5% is good. Um, and then uh, we're wondering if we should um, require long-term spaces for all our new multifamily developments. Um, yeah, I think that's all the questions that we can think about. OK, questions? Um, Commissioner Rosenberg. Well, I just have a comment. And I, I'm just really glad to see these types of things happening. I'm just sitting here thinking about some of my past <laughs> when I was on the city council and we'd be talking about a development and we'd say, you know, it'd be kind of good to have a bike rack. And they go, yeah, that'd be good. So it's really good to see that we have really progressed to unnecessary, I mean, very necessary. And I'm glad to see that because there was thought about, it was like a second thought. And maybe we'll have a bike rack for five bikes. But it's just, uh, it's really good to see that this is happening. And uh, just to you know, give you a little bit of history, that it, <laughs> I've seen it evolve into something good. So this is good, good to see. Um, Council Member Hayford O'Leary. Yeah, I appreciate um, Commissioner Rosenberg's comments because things have really changed and I don't know the exact timing of the current language, but I think it's like 2008, 2010, something like that. And to think of how far Richfield has come since 2010 in bike friendliness, that when I moved here in 2012, there, were, there wasn't a single official bike lane in the city. There were a couple of bikeable shoulders. And now we've moved to, as you know, do you mind going back to the map just for a second? We moved to the situation of like many of these are like high comfort bikeways, bikeways that aren't just for people like me who feel very comfortable in traffic, but people of all ages and all fitness levels. And so I'm hoping that bike parking furthers that and helps with that. So I really support, uh, certainly support it increasing over the current level. Um, I would really like us to move away from the specific ratio of bike parking, just because oftentimes as car parking goes down, bike parking needs go up as people are using e-bikes and e-scooters and other things. I'd really like us to just specify our own independent table per land use. This is what we want to do. Um, I certainly support long-term parking. I think Minneapolis is, is a good starter point for multifamily. 
Um, although I did mention cost, it is, it's extremely cost effective compared to car parking. So it's something that business, buildings should absolutely be encouraging. And then I said a number of, of points, which I'm certainly happy to share with anyone to staff, of just specific ideas. The one thing I really wanted to highlight is a, a flaw that's happening is, like I mentioned, uh, different, you know, more people are getting into biking, older senior citizens are getting e-bikes and so on. And one flaw that's really common with those bike rooms is that they almost all, always require bikes to be lifted. So I would like us to go a little bit beyond Minneapolis and specifying that a certain percentage of spaces you should be able to roll your bike into so you've got more flexibility on the type of bikes that can happen. But I think this is so important. This is like how we make people be able to use this on an everyday basis, not just for recreation, but to make bicycling to the store, bicycling to get a cup of coffee, a really practical option. So I'm, I'm happy with it. Let's. Let's uh, blow those other suburbs out of the water. <laughs> other questions or comments? Commissioner Keneally. Uh, I'll, I'll second that. I, I like Minneapolis's approach in a lot of ways. Um, I, I would hope to see moving away from tying the ratio to parking spaces and, and instead tying it to square footage. Commission, uh, Council Member Whelan. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was going to ask, I know uh, for our like car parking zoning, there is like a, an allowed reduction near transit. Is there, I mean, could we create a situation where, I mean, we're getting into the great situation where most all of our major uh, thoroughfares are near biking paths, but could we create something where like near a bike path there is or just generally that there's kind of a trade-off of if you offer these additional bike parking spaces that then we could reduce the car parking total. Um, and I, th I think especially near um, some of the major biking thoroughfares, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but yes, generally would, it, would agree with the other comments that were made. Um, my only other thing that hadn't been mentioned, when, uh, when they count spaces is it like a single hoop is two bike parking spaces okay i'm seeing nods because i um i also support we haven't talked about much but i do support the like no less than blank number um because and i don't know how to clarify this in in a code but a lot of times when developers try and make uh bike racks that look fancier or artistic, um, they actually only hold one bike, if that. Um, and so there's a lot of not terribly functional bike racks and just would want to make sure that our ratio is high enough that we aren't actually cutting in half how many bikes can really park there. Other comments? Council Member Seppel. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to echo that I think it's really important for the long term that it's enclosed because I know when we go and tour of different developments and stuff, that was one of the features that stood out to me in some of the newer developments is that there is an actual safe place to store the bike and you don't have to worry about things like security and theft and the weather and that kind of stuff. So thank you. Other comments? Um, I'll just add a couple things and they're not necessarily extremely related to this, but um, I know we talked about the schools and that there might not be requirements. I don't know what that reviewing that would look like, but especially as we're trying to, as we're building out the infrastructure, it does hopefully become more possible to bike and walk to school. So I don't know if that's in the ball court of the schools making those policies or us working with them, but I do think just checking that out and making sure um, it makes sense as well for our schools, because of course I'd love to see as many kids biking safely to and from school as possible and their, and their parents. Um, so I don't want that off the radar, but maybe it's not. And then the other part of that conversation is I understand that we have a staff person that's working on biking and walking to school, but that person is in the Richfield School District, which doesn't include all of our schools in the, in the city of Richfield. Um, and I know that that's a discussion we've had, but just making sure as we are thinking about our students and our families that it's not just limited to the Richfield Public Schools, but inclusive of other schools and even childcare facilities or other places 
um, as well. So that's not directly related to this. I don't have much more to add from what I've heard already on this topic, but I wanted to just um, add those other points. Other, oh, go ahead. I, I did just want to add one thing. Just to clarify, this will apply, like all of our new zoning codes, it will apply to new businesses or new developments um, or more places that are making substantial changes. That said, uh, Richfield has a bike grant, bike rack grant program. Um, and I need to look back at the details. I believe it's been targeted at commercial business, but um, that might be an opportunity for us to help the schools if they needed help with bike racks or help some of our older multifamily developments if they don't have bike racks now um, to install those. So we'll need to take another look at those program guidelines, but that would be a way for us to help retrofit um, some of these developments. Other comments or questions, Councilman Maroon? Um, I would add churches to that list as someone who used to work at one that I, I think biking to church is lovely and um, many churches don't have it and often uh, fundraising for something like that is not high on the list. I can tell you that Hope Church will now have bike racks. Mm -hmm. Just as an FYI, they're making enough changes that they will have bike racks. Great. Other questions or comments? Councilmember Hayford O'Leary. Just one other thing from my, from my uh, unfortunately, very long list. Thank you, staff, who hopefully read the whole email. Uh, I just wanted to add, I, we do exclude really small uses now, and I would hope we can move away from that with some flexibility, just because like a coffee shop is probably more like the place you're going to go to than a Menards. Menards should have bike racks, too, but like we, we should accom accommodate those small uses. And I did provide a suggestion, if Public Works is okay with it, that with a permit appropriately, that a bike rack installed in the right of way where there's space could count. To th I'm thinking like those businesses on East 66th Street or something where it might be just hard to position a bike rack in a good spot on their own property and, and we did read all of those comments and we did make note they were good comments thank you for providing them thank you for reading them other questions or comments okay looks like we can move to the next item we're right on time guys nice job okay Yes, yes. <laughs> Th that I was going to call you on it and make you, make you speed it up. Um, Nellie, if you could advance the slides. Okay. So um, this is just to remind everyone, or if anyone wasn't at that initial work session, right now we conditionally permit um, firearms related uses in the C2 General Commercial District and MUR, which is our mixed use regional district. Um, in our buffer distances are 100 feet from residentially zoned property, 300 feet from these other protected uses, schools, churches, daycares, public libraries, or government buildings. We talked about the problems with some of that language. 1,000 feet from other gun or ammunition businesses. And then we limit the hours of operation. And there are some uh, requirements related to firing ranges. So on July 26th, um, we talked about continuing to require a CUP in all instances, so not uh, um, exempting the smaller incidental or accessory uses from that CUP requirement. Um, adding MUC to the allowable locations with that conditional use permit, so long as it was meeting all those buffer requirements. Um, increasing our residential buffer to 250 feet. This is um, in alignment with Minneapolis and Bloomington, working on that consistency, um, just kind of in this south-southwest corridor. And including both uh, uses that are zoned and used for residential purposes, not just zoned and then adding parks to our list of protected uses. So this is uh, what our map looked like before. You can see that there were a number, it's the parcels, this is confusing, it remains a confusing map, but we're doing our best. The, the buildings that are outlined in that kind of neon green yellow are the buildings where somewhere in that building it, is, it would be possible under our current regulations to have a firearms related use. Um, so now, Nellie, if you'll go to the next map. So we've extend, extended this buffer. Again, we're looking at, at the neon buildings. Um, this includes parks now. It increases the buffering distance from residential to 250 feet. It left all of the daycares in. Um, it did allow it in MUC. 
So this, this is what we're left with. There are 27 parcels on this map where, in theory, um, a firearms-related use could go somewhere in that building on that parcel. So as we're looking at this, you can see that most of them are concentrated along 494. Um, there is an opportunity up at the northeast corner near Target in that Target Home Depot development. Um, and then a couple of buildings over on the Edina border, just some really small buildings over there. The one I wanted to call your attention to is downtown. That came up in our last meeting that that felt like um, to at least some people a very inappropriate place to have a possible firearms related use. Now in these buildings, you know, this that's the Woodlake uh, Plaza building. So it would generally be one of those office spaces could maybe have this use, something like that. But what I wanted to mention was, when we look at this, there with 27 parcels where this is available, we have more than enough places where this would be allowed, that, that we would be OK in terms of challenges, legal challenges. We could say, we just don't want it in downtown. It's not allowed. So we could add that. This, so th these are all the buffers that you asked for. What I wanted to ask you was, do you also want to include, we are not going to allow these within 1,000 feet of 66th and Lindale, or 1,000 feet of 66th, anywhere in that down, make some sort of circle, <laughs> say this is downtown, and we don't want it here either. So that's, I just want to confirm but this is kind of what you thought that map was going to look like. You're generally OK with this. And then get your feedback on the downtown thought. Council Member Seppel. I just wanted a clarification question. Mm -hmm. We were looking at the former city garage site at one point for residential. Is that one of the neon green parts that would suddenly go away? I was trying to think if that's one of the rectangles that's no, you've got the, so that's Best Buy starting over there. Then you've got Dick's Sporting Goods. The next ones you see in green are Shops at Lindale. Um, and then the, our garage site is um, shaded. It's not allowed. Okay, so that won't be an issue then? No. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Menards is the next one that you see. Councilmember Hayford O'Leary. Yes, please exclude downtown Richfield from the map. Um, I think this is a lot better than it was before, but I, and I, it's unlikely. I think Woodlake Center would, would rent to a gun shop, but I see no reason to allow it. It's such a weird, isolated area. And since we have to have it somewhere, 494 just seems to be more natural. Councilmember Whalen. Um, maybe I'm just a bad judge of distance. Is that Woodlake Center truly that far away from the senior living places that are right next door? There are parts of. There are parts of that building that, yes, are far enough away. So it's, so it's not the whole the... building. It would be like this tenant space and this particular location of Got that it. building okay. could Thank have you. it. Then, yes, I would also be comfortable excluding downtown. That seems fair. Other comments or questions? Commissioner Keneally. I, I agree. There's just a, a lot of residential over there. OK. Other comments, questions? I'll just echo, um, I agree as well. Even like knowing some of the businesses and some of the types of community members that go into that space um, in that building, I wouldn't feel comfortable either. So I agree with just excluding downtown for sure. And I'm surprised that there's still spaces left after all those additions that we made <laughs> and that there's plenty of them. Um, so that was a pleasant surprise. Kind of makes me want to up that residential bump. <laughs> yeah. I, w I will say, I, I'm generally in, in agreement with that. However, um, I do think it makes sense to be consistent with Minneapolis and Bloomington. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. Councilmember Seppel. That was what I was going to say. I think it's really good that we're consistent so that we're not like an island or a pocket. It's good to have consistency regionally. Other comments or questions? OK. Bef uh, before I just go back to staff and make sure on all the items you got what you needed and if you could just do a quick recap are we good on this one this last one yes so um, the Planning Commission can expect to see this in the next couple of months we do have a little bit of extra uh, leeway because we extended the moratorium 
Um, but in addition to these changes here, the other one that I'll call to your attention is the um, firing ranges. We had some discussion about that at the last session. I do believe now, as of now, we will come forward with an ordinance that leaves them in the ordinance. Um, part of the reason is that we have one here at City Hall and we don't want to make it non-conforming, although we could, it could stay. Um, and then the comments from um, Public Safety Director, um, uh, from Jay, who said that in general, he doesn't really think that th that would be very likely. Um, so it doesn't seem to hurt to leave those in. Other than that, you'll see an ordinance, I think, that reflects our two discussions here. Great. Any other questions um, that you need more clarity on from any of the items from staff? Um, yes, I was just thinking, um, did we did we have a kind of a consensus on the gas station requirement for electric vehicles? Is that good to require them there, or should we exclude that as a called out requirement? Uh, so I know com um, Council Member Whelan shared his opinion on that. Um, I guess, you know, I was, mine is more of just like not understanding like how that really worked, but even I just liked some of the points you said, um, Council Member Whelan, like we could even look at doing more, you know, or a higher grade or faster charging, or, you know, there's a lot of considerations. It's just, for me, it's not intuitive, but it's a topic I really don't know anything about. So um, I'm not opposed to putting it in gas stations. It just is not making a lot of sense to me. Commissioner Keneally. Oh, go ahead, and then I'll go to uh, Council Member Whelan. Um, hey, for the <laughs> I'm, I'm not a... I'm not a, thank you, by the way. Uh, I'm not opposed to having them in gas stations. I was just thinking about the small footprint and uh, the high turn. Um, so I didn't want them to be where we concentrated our, our efforts. Council Member Hayford O'Leary. Um, I, I guess I don't like them in gas stations in part just because I think gas stations are kind of a legacy use that I would hope that we're moving away from with EVs and just in general in Richfield because they're a really crappy land use. They, you know, they pollute, they're noisy, they're disruptive to neighbors. Minneapolis bans them altogether for our new installation. And uh, with regard to Councilor Whalen's comments, you're, you're right that like planning for a trip is, is important, but if you look at a Tesla map, it's like you go to any Hardy's lot and you're allowed to hang out there with your Tesla charger. I mean, that, that's accounted for. It's just, I think requiring it from gas stations, I would much rather see us just like make it harder to build a gas station than to like require that a gas station be nice enough and include an EV charger since this is mainly for new development. So yeah. I'd rather, rather restrict them altogether than have gas stations with EV chargers. Council Member Seppel. I'm guessing that this requirement is so that they could kind of transition that use to some to the new form of transportation. So it's kind of like as you transition from one form of transportation to another, it was a way to do the transition is my guess is why that was included. And I'm fine with saying you need to have them there. Council Member Whelan. I guess um, one, maybe this is responding less to the electric vehicle question and more to Council Member Hayford O'Leary's comments. Uh, I don't necessarily disagree, you, uh, disagree with you about the use of a gas pump, that I think that is going to go away in the future. It will need to. Um, but the convenience store aspect is something that, given how many parts of our city are a food desert, that that is where people can go for food in some cases um, if they don't have access to transportation. And so obviously that's a different issue I would love to fix, but I don't think that just getting rid of gas stations or not allowing them at all is the answer. Just very briefly, yeah, I, I agree totally. They do serve a valuable purpose, and I would love to have convenience stores. I just think that model of gas stations is largely dying of like that being the place you go to refuel. Um, and in general, again, since we're talking about mostly new development, like if we had like a two-acre site that became like a gigantic quick trip, well, Facebook would love it, but that would be a disaster, like development-wise. So I really don't want us to be like planning around that being the model. Um, yeah, if, if somebody if we wanted to incentivize one of the little gas stations on 66 to do that, that would be cool. I guess I just don't know it's well addressed by this item. Other comments or questions? Anything else from staff that you want us to discuss on those? No. Sorry, just have one more thing. Oh, go ahead. I'm just the, the timeline on the bike parking thing. Do you know when that would actually come before Planning Commission and Council? 
We don't have a timeline. Um, you know, we're, we've got a lot on our plate right now. I'm hoping that we can get these things adopted here um, by the end of the year, early in 2022. That okay. is our plan. That, that sounds great. I was just going to emphasize that we, we, we're doing a new bicycle friendly the community, app, community application due next fall, so like a year from now. Mm -hmm. So it would be great if this was totally done by next spring, summer. Um, and that would really help our application, especially if we have a great new ordinance. Yep, I think I think that's doable. Any other comments or questions from folks before we adjourn? All right, I will adjourn our work session. Thank you so much to our staff for all the work prepared on both of on these three items. Thank you.